podcast should be live. Let me blow this up. I thought I did this video ages ago. But it is the Patreon request of the month for the Patreon in question. So I'm going to do it again. But I thought I did this one ages ago. I don't know. Maybe I did it on Warcorp 666. I, I, I don't know. But uh, I don't really give a shit. Um, but I, I thought I've done this one. Uh, anyway, give her a couple of minutes to come on in here. And, uh, this video is about 28 minutes long. So that's why I'm doing this live format. Probably take me about an hour. And then after this, it will be my last live stream of the day. Because Lord knows I have, uh, man, I got some brats with some beer and onions in the slow cooker right now. They're just poaching, poaching themselves. And we're going to throw them on uh, the griddle a little later and uh, crisp them all up. And uh, along with that, we're going to make some uh, hot dogs and some burgers and uh, chicken. And we're going to have some, well, we're going to have a great old time. Except for some people uh, actually uh, experiencing some stomach issues in my house. The chicken will be just chicken. With nothing. <laughs> anyway. Let's get into the jackass that doesn't know what the hell he's talking about with grilling. And the wine box Karen that probably hasn't seen Dick. For 45 years. Hi, I'm Tracy Schumacher, food and drink reporter from the Democrat and Chronicle. We're here today a little later than usual because poor Stephen Reichlin has spent the whole day in an airport trying to get to Rochester. But thank you for coming to us. I am happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. So if you have any questions about grilling or barbecuing or smoking, uh, Please uh, join in the Facebook Live conversation, but no worries, I have tons. I have enough to, uh, you know, get, get us through this. Um, I did ask people on Twitter yes. to um, give me some suggestions of, of things that they'd want to know. Yeah. And a, a man named Mike uh, wanted to know if you had one grill, which you have a lot of equipment, I know, but if you could have one grill, what would it be? If I could have one grill, it would be the Weber Performer. It's a charcoal kettle grill in a cart uh, that has a propane igniter at the bottom. So it lights charcoal. You get all the virtues of uh, grilling with charcoal, but this little gas igniter. That's funny. I, I, there's a reporter named Megan McDermott that sits mm -hmm. right across from me in the, in the newsroom, and that's exactly what she has. She was telling me all yep. about it, and she just loves it. I just have the plain old kettle charcoal grills. Do you know what I'd like? A Santa Fe style grill. Because that does wood grilling. And if I'm out in the middle of nowhere with nothing, I'd rather have the grill that's adapted at wood. So, uh, you know what? That would be my second choice. And if I could, had, could only have one grill to take to a d deserted island, it would be the kettle grill. Because I'm figuring you can't get replacement propane, propane. cylinders for it. Yeah, so. okay. Well, that makes sense. Okay, so um, I, I guess I'm going to start with just the question I have I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Ginny, if you want to run this play-by-play, -play, I don't know if this is easy to do, but so you are here because yeah. you have this wonderful book, yeah. Barbecue, Sauces, Rubs, and Marinade, mm -hmm. pretty new. Yeah. And the one one of the recipes that caught my eye was pineapple. Grilled which, pineapple. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. And I mean, I've grilled pineapple before. I've put it on a kebab and this and that. But this had you do it with a 
coconut milk mm -hmm. and um, the turbinado sugar with the spices. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it sounded so good. It's pretty outrageous. So here's what happened. I um, lit my charcoal, you know, my uh, chimney starter yep. mm -hmm. in the grill mm -hmm. um, and went on and we, we were doing some other things at my house and sort of forgot about it. Kay. And um, by the time I dumped yep. the charcoal, yep. that the stuff was burnt down pretty good. Right. And when I put the, the pineapple on the grill grates mm -hmm. and saw what was going on, it was kind of dripping instead of caramelizing. Right. I knew it wasn't hot enough. It wasn't hot enough. Yeah. Okay, so to me, a good, I, I know how to cook, I know how to yeah. bake, and I usually know how to adjust to it. But I think with grilling, that's, that's what I don't know is how to adjust to that. What do you do when you've got... Well, it means you're a fucking idiot. At that, you know you don't have the right fire. Is there anything to do at that point? Yeah. Yeah, add more fuel, but then you're waiting for 35 minutes. Yes, you take the grate off, you add more charcoal, you wait till it's burning, and then you put the uh, pineapple on. Okay. Now, so I yeah, look now, look, in truth, if I was doing this recipe with pineapple... I would have used a gas grill. I know, I know. Come at me. Come at me one and all, you fucking charcoal purists. But I would have used my gas grill. The reason is, is it's sugar. It's extremely temperamental. I would have used my gas grill so I can control the heat so you get wonderful caramelization and not burnt shit. I would not have used my charcoal grill for this one. That's just fucking me. And by the way, Steve Reichlin has used gas grills before, so fuck you. Looking at your video there, it looks like you got one piece. I did. That is that is beautiful. Um, and I put but, that on top. But this is the, um, as we all do, <laughs> uh, this is the, you know, this is both the joy and the challenge of grilling with charcoal. It's a mercurial fuel. It has hot spots and cool spots. It burns down. Um, and it requires much more attention, which to me is actually what makes it fun. Mm -hmm. uh, burns hotter than gas. Well, also, she, she used briquettes, which she shouldn't have had this problem with the stage in those briquettes where those briquettes were. Now, I, I like my favorite charcoal to use is lump charcoal. And it burns hotter than the halls of hell, but you do get a nice bit of low heat, but it's a quick bit. Yes, but what I would have done in your shoes at that point, I would have said to everybody, you know what, we're gonna take a little breather, Take the grate off, add more natural lump charcoal, uh, put the grate back on. You can kind of tell with your hand. If you hold your hand about three inches above the fire and it hurts, mm -hmm. you're hot. And you need a hot fire because the beauty of this dish when you get it right is that the, the pineapple is caramelized and candied on the outside and it's still raw and juicy on the inside. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of like what you do with a creme brulee, melting yeah. that sugar and exactly. getting it nice and brown. I could see that it wasn't going in the right direction. But, but um, you persisted. I did, and it was still tasty, yeah. so. Um, okay. And yet somehow she's allowed on TV. So we have a question. Yeah. And that is your views on injecting meats before smoking or grilling. Hmm. Um, injecting meats before smoking and grilling is a little bit like sex in teenagers. You know, <laughs> the minute they discover it, uh, <laughs> you want to do it all the time. But uh, injecting used judiciously and sparingly is a great thing. I like to inject turkey, for example, because turkey breasts have this tendency to dry out. Mm -hmm. um, so Not if you do it properly, Mr. Jackass. Sometimes I'll inject a really thick pork chop, but... You know, if you inject every food, then everything sort of starts to taste like injecting. Usually what you're injecting is melted butter and beef and, uh, and some kind of broth, chicken stock. Now, if you make your own chicken stock, you know, that's great. If you're using a commercial chicken stock that's sort of salty and has that monosodium glutamate mm -hmm. flavor, then that, you know, that can get old fast. Okay. Yeah. So, turkey? So, judiciously. Yeah. Turkey, uh, especially and always. Um... Yeah, and b b big hunks of meat that tend to be dry. Good question. That was a good question. That was a good question. How about charcoal versus gas? That, you know, that, it, it, that is a big debate.
So you didn't even bring up the possibility of injecting butter? Okay, you're a fucking idiot. I think with a lot of people. Well, the true answer is neither. It's wood because both charcoal and gas give you heat but no flavor. But mm -hmm. when you cook over a wood fire, you get... Oh, heat. my God, are you fucking serious? No, there is a difference, yes, between a hamburger that has been cooked over a lump charcoal fire, a gas fire, and a goddamn wood fire. I've done them all, motherfucker. And guess what? For like a burger, your best bet is lump charcoal. Why? Well, the gas the gas is okay. It's a nice all-purpose cooking medium. But the wood imparts so much fucking smoke flavor, your burger's ruined. That's just been my experience with it. Wood smoke flavor. So you get the chunks of, of wood? I'm, well, I'm talking about more primal to that. I'm really? thinking campfire. I'm thinking wood-burning grill. I'm thinking uh, um, f fire pit. You know, really the, the, the kind of primal stuff. And, of course, with traditional American barbecue, especially as practiced in Texas. Oh, yeah, 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 Mr. Northeastern fucking. Yeah, you really know about primal. Just you'd be fueling your smoker with logs. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, let's be practical, okay? Because wood is heavy to schlep, wood-burning grills are often expensive, most of us... No, they're not. Just dig out a pit in your backyard and throw some wood in it and throw a grill grate over it. Cost $18. Uh, you know, don't build campfires in our backyards. No. Uh, although it's worth trying. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. What in the fuck are you talking about? Um, so that being said. Oh, uh, let me check. Oh, I, I got the pop. I, I got it. L.A. Kings fan. Uh, sorry, that was from the games and beer last night. Uh, you know, I guess I prefer charcoal because, first of all, it's higher heat. You're actually getting to play with fire. Um, very easy to smoke on a charcoal grill, almost impossible on a gas grill. You can caveman on a charcoal grill. It's difficult to caveman. I mean, um, I will agree with him there. I, I got I got to give the son of a bitch that. Uh, it is almost impossible to smoke anything worth a damn on a on a gas grill. You can't. Ca well, part of it is them too, L.A. Kings fan. Okay, all right, everyone can hear it. Caveman on a gas grill. But ever um, the uh, ever being the uh, bridger between enemy camps, I will also say that I have a gas grill. I use my gas grill. I cooked on it last night. So the real secret is multiple grill ownership. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, I'm not a purist either. The only thing I the only grill I don't want to buy, I don't want to get, and I don't want to own is a pellet grill. I don't think they do nearly as good a job at smoking shit as a stick burner. I don't, I I don't, and I and I don't, and I think they're a waste of money for like just regular grilling. So they're an inferior smoker, and they're an inferior grill, and they're caught. They cost a, a shit ton, and yeah, I got the money in my desk drawer right now to buy one, but I just. Why the fuck would I spend hundreds of dollars to buy a grill I don't fucking want? I'm not going to fucking like. And it has to have an electrical outlet. Fuck it. That sounds good. Now, it's funny. I came home with a, a gas grill, and my, my husband acted like I was... You know, sacrilegious. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, now we're a multiple grill well, family. Well, good. There you go. We're coexisting so far. Good. Um, yeah. So she has a husband. Eesh. But no, typically, typically, if I were to, if I were to advise people on what to get for a backyard grill, get a decent gas grill, a uh, decent propane grill. And then a uh, Weber 
uh, the the Weber with the charcoal s sorter costs about two hundred dollars, two hundred twenty dollars maybe. Uh, where you can scrape the the thing and use that to burn your uh, lump charcoal and do offset grilling things of that nature. You don't need fifty seven fucking grills, okay? Again, uh, the other things I would also advise buying is an outdoor griddle and an outdoor range. These can be purchased for $200 and $100 respectively. So, actually, I had a question. You mentioned that you grilled last night. I did. Okay, do you do you ever cook without grilling or smoking? Um, rarely. Uh, three nights ago, we scored... So I live on Martha's Vineyard. Mm -hmm. and nice. Three nights ago, we scored some... Oh, yes. This guy is supposed to be the fucking expert, and he lives on Martha's Vineyard. How much you want to bet Mo Kason would whoop this guy's ass in a barbecue off? I'll leave you to all Google Mo Kason. He'd whoop this guy's ass. Even though I fucking hate him, Myron Mixon would whoop this guy's ass at barbecue. And grilling. Uh, amazingly fresh steamers that were dug mm -hmm. by a real island character. And um, we cooked those for tr the traditional way, steaming them in a, you know, over a pot of seawater. And they were astonishing beyond belief. Um, you could have always cooked them outside. Maybe it's not grilling, but at least it's outside. Sounds good. Yeah, that was good. But last night, so last night we had an interesting meal last night. Um, uh, we had a Wagyu steak, mm -hmm. so it was incredibly well marbled. And oh, yes, it only cost 80 fucking dollars. And I've been using a, um, a technique a lot lately called plancha grilling. I'm working on a new book now uh, called Project Fire. And it's the By the way, I'd like to point out this guy is a failed novelist. If you couldn't fucking tell. This guy against anybody would have his ass whipped in a goddamn grill off. I'm surprised more more figures from the barbecue world and the grilling world have not called this cocksucker out. Because he's the face of it. The bookend to my book, Project Smoke. In fact, the TV show next year will be Project Fire instead of Project Smoke. So, plancha grilling, basically a plancha is a cast iron griddle. You put it on your grill, uh, you heat it, ideally with a charcoal or wood fire, so you get some wood smoke kind of curling over the lip. And I cook the uh, Wagyu steak because Wagyu steak has so much fat in it if you direct... Oh my god, Wagyu steak is fucking impossible to fuck up. That's why this one filet costs you 80 goddamn dollars. Oh my god, my old man bladder is acting up. I have to go pee. Hell, the fucking brats that I'm cooking right now would beat his ass. Because my brats are going to be 
right now, they're basically cooking in a beer bath with onions. Some, some nice Vidalia onions. When they're done, I'm going to slam them on a uh, ripping hot grill. And basically, I'm going to caramelize all the sugars from the beer and, and, and the onions and all the other shit. And burn any onions off and basically just sear the outside. Those motherfuckers that beat whatever this motherfucker did, if we were, whatever bratwurst recipe this jackass would come up with. There's a reason why, ladies and gentlemen, this guy slathers everything in fucking sauce. By the way, if you have never, and I mean never, Take him bratwurst, put him in a slow cooker, uh, covered it with about two, two sweet onions, two Vidalia onions, whatever you want to call them. You chop them up, you just slice them up. Just slice them up. Leave the slice of soul. Chop them in half and, and, and slice them up. And then covered it with, it It took me about, now I have, a, I have the bigger slow cooker, I think the 5.6 quart one. It took me about six tall boys. To, to fill up uh, five or six tall boys. Um, I probably could have saved a beer or two if I'd have put the brats in and then d covered them in onions, but yeah, whatever. And just leave that on the counter for, well, depending on your heat level. Like, if you're going to go to work and you do this before you go to work, put it on low, leave that motherfucker there for eight hours, and oh my God, when they come off the grill. And basically what you want to do is you want the you want the slow cooker to cook them. And then you slam them on the grill. You caramelize them all up. And oh my God. God damn it. Is it good. Steve Reichlin has never opened a restaurant in his life. And this guy's MO is just slather everything with sauce. No, he's talking about cooking a Wagyu piece of beef. If I may, if I spent that amount of money on a goddamn piece of fucking beef, I want to taste what I paid for. And he'll probably come up with some fucking horseradish sauce. I grill it, you're going to get a lot of fat dripping in the fire, a lot of flare-ups. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I did a dish that uh, is really fun. I call it smashed potatoes, oh, where yum. you smoke roast a potato, almost like you're baking it, but with wood smoke. And then you put it on this griddle that has been well oiled with YU beef fat. And at the last minute, you take a salt brick and you pew, smash it. So you kind of, it's a, it, it's almost like a, 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 a non grated latke cooked wow. in YU beef fat. Oh yeah, my that was goodness. pretty good. I'm getting, getting so good. hungry. I'm getting hungry and, too. And that, that, that plancha, does that give a nice, um, so basically what he did was did a smashed potato and just didn't bother to add any salt. Good for him. Um, like crust almost to the um, Yeah, it gives steak? you a very good sear. Okay. Very good sear. No grill marks, but a very good sear. Nice. And uh, plancha, it's useful for foods that are stick prone. For example, if you're cooking uh, a sawfish like uh, mm -hmm. a flounder or a sole uh, or even a salmon filet, you know, prone to stick to the grill grate. It's a great way to do those. If you're cooking a lot of small foods, if you're cooking shrimp or... You know, you could just buy some cedar planks and they get some wonderful smoke flavor too, but uh, I guess you don't care about that. And by the way, fuck you. Dollops, you know, where it's kind of hard to 10 to 20 of those, you put them in the plancha, very easy to grill. Mmm, sounds good. Okay, I'm, I'm checking. Salivating over this conversation. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Especially because I don't think any of us have had dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, tips for brisket. That's a tough one. It Boy, can be tough. Brisket is simultaneously the easiest and most difficult dish there is. Mm -hmm. uh, see oh, I've done your fucking brisket thing. And I ripped it apart. You don't know what the fuck you're doing it with salt and pepper cook it at 225 to 250 degrees in a smoker yeah exactly with we actually yeah with wago beef it's like you want the fat in there you paid all the money for it
It's like, just because it's beef doesn't mean it has to be grilled. Uh, for, I, I bought, let's say you have an eight or nine piece, pound piece of brisket with a nice layer of fat on it, you know, looking at probably 10 to 12 hour smoke mm -hmm. until it reaches an internal temperature of 200 and five degrees, it's a little higher than in many cookbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the seed. 205? It's beef, motherfucker! Have you ever heard of a tartare? The secret is when it's about uh, 180 degrees, you wrap it in butcher paper. Now, really? not the kind of butcher paper you get at a Whole Foods or a Fresh Market, but real old-fashioned butcher paper that's paper without a plastic lining. So uh, that butcher paper will breathe, it'll let the humidity out, but it'll seal the juices in. Once you reach that magic temperature for brisket, it goes in and... Great, so butcher paper that I can get at about 17 places in the country. Insulated cooler for an hour to two hours to rest and relax. You cut into it, it would be fabulous. When you get brisket right, you should be able to take the end of a wooden spoon and just sort of sink it right through the meat. See, I'm getting hungry and hungry. Me now. too. <laughs> okay, another question. What? That's... It's fucking beef. Why in the hell are you going to 210 on beef? One sixty is well done, motherfucker. You know, it doesn't require two ten to melt all that fat. Just so you know. What international cuisine has the best barbecue? Also, Franklin of Franklin Barbecue, probably the most famous brisket man on the planet, would be laughing his ass off if he heard that. Barbecue grilling culture, in your opinion. Oh, boy, boy. That's, that's a tough one. You know, because he doesn't wrap his briskets for shit, and he'd probably whoop you. He. Uh, if he challenge you, you just run away. You just concede. Um, sort of my beat is Planet Barbecue. In fact, that's the name of a book I wrote a few years ago. And uh, since 1994, when I started in this business, I've been traveling around the world to write about barbecuing and grilling. Uh, and I've been to more than 60 countries, all of which have something interesting to offer. But if I had to just pick six, because I can't six. limit it down <laughs> any more than that. Uh, I would say Japan, which is the home of my birth, for the absolute simplicity and pristine purity of its grilling. I'd say Indonesia. Examples? Where is the simplistic purity of a Japanese grill? Because a lot of Japanese meat is marinated to fuck. Just not for nothing. If it's a simplistic grill, it's meat fire. That's it. Oh, my God. And how many fucking Japanese grill chefs have just shit themselves? Hmm. Uh, which proves that uh, great things do come in small packages. Very extravagant spicing. India has to be on that list because this is the epicenter of the spice route and Indian grilling is all about spice. And God forbid you put America on there, although I think you might. We have to name Turkey, right? Because that was the birthplace of shish kebab. Delicious. Uh, I have to name Brazil, interestingly. Argentina, it's always kind of a, a toss up between Brazil and, um, and uh, Argentina, but Brazil has raised the art of spit roasting to, I mean, to the le level of Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. And finally, I have to name our old United States because we're oh, one of the yeah. only countries that we both have this incredible smoking tradition and grilling tradition. And uh, we belong right up there in the pantheon of smoking and grilling stars. Well, sure. And there's, there's so many different 
approaches to that, even just regionally, <laughs> you know, with the barbecue Amen. and all that other yeah. kind of Amen. stuff. So yeah. that's awesome. But what's mind-boggling is, okay, you think about a country like Indonesia, which is, I forget how many thousands or tens of thousands of islands, and their barbecue is every bit as much as regional as ours, you know, to... Someone, uh, an outsider, maybe it's there's a sort of all taste similar, but I mean, they do this wonderful duck that is roasted in um, in, in palm fronds. Uh, they do a suckling pig that's stuffed with lemongrass and chilies and wild leeks and. Wow, it sounds wonderful. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting cruel. <laughs> hey, you know, before we move on to more grilling questions, yes. I have to make sure you get your plug in. Yes. You're going to be at an event tomorrow. I am, and I would love for you to tell me about it uh, because <laughs> I do a lot of these, and I'm not sure I have the particulars at my fingertips. Okay, well, so let's see how I do. It's called Barbecue Brews and Blues with Stephen Reichlin. Stephen mm -hmm. Reichlin, see, look mm -hmm. at it, I'm going to... The fact that his name was attached to beer is an affront to the Lord of Patriarchy. May the Knights of Testosterone visit upon him a harsh punishment. It's all right. I'm not even looking at notes. It's a fundraiser for WXXI, our wonderful public TV station. It's at Frontier Field. There's a... You look like you're a fucking public access station, bitch. VIP reception at noon, and I think one is when the general admission is. It consists of wonderful food, some brews, there's some great bands playing, and uh, the doors open at one, and uh, let's see, $50? $50, and that includes uh, this one. Keep in mind, this jackass bought Steel Reserve as a good beer. Wonderful cookbook. He doesn't drink beer. You know, and uh, I think you're doing a demonstration. I'm doing a grilling demonstration, and I will sign those books. Uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, and um, you know, it's so important to uh, to uh, support public television and public radio, especially in the um, in the age we're living today. It's uh, I, I can't say you know I, I'm an well, let's see. Public radio is boring as getting a blowjob from an Amish girl. And public TV is not much better. Avid consumer of uh, public media, and uh, I just urge, urge... Yeah, because you're a closeted liberal elite fuckhead who would have his ass whipped have he ever actually challenged anyone in barbecue? Myself included. Yeah, I'll whip your ass, Stephen Reichlin. I'll tell you how real barbecue's done, motherfucker. It isn't done with $700 Wagyu steaks. Grilling was taking whatever the fuck you found and making it delicious, bitch! I urge people to come out and support the station and also to eat some really great barbecue. Okay, cool. So if, if, I, was, uh, if I was more practiced in this, I would have had notes or something, but I think we did okay. Yeah. Actually, I would love him to see, to see him do that too. Hammerhead547 says, I'd love to see him do a ve venison tenderloin recipe. It's one of the trickiest cuts of meat to cook properly. Yeah, there's no fat! There's nothing. Because venison, if, if, if viewers don't know, is deer. There's nothing. Like, you're, you're, oh, holy shit. Now, if it was me, oh, boy, I'd probably marinate it in a marinade and smoke it low and slow and get whatever tenderness I can out of it and then serve it. That's just me, though. Okay, so we've got some more questions. Any? Well, this is a good one. This I would absolutely not know this. Hell, one. I'd love him to see... I, I'd like to see him deal with buffalo. Another meat that has no fat that turns tough and stringy when you blink at it wrong. Okay. Any tips for smoking... 
eggs. David Vernon, that's Smoking that's eggs, one of my favorite topics. And it's funny and it's very timely because I was just speaking with my assistant today. You know, we're kind of working on the, uh, we just turned in the manuscript for Project um, Fire and now we're kind of rounding out. You know, people think you write a book with great deliberation, which I do, uh -huh. but then you arrive at a moment where an editor on call and say, I need a uh, copy to fill a half a page so that it'll, the oh, <laughs> layout right. right or the really? photo will fit right. Huh. So uh, we're going to add a box on great grilled and smoked eggs around the world. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely, because they do it in Vietnam, they do it in Cambodia, they do it in Israel. But smoked eggs, you hard boil an egg first, cook a little bit under, mm -hmm. and <coughs> Then if you have a smoker, you smoke at a low temperature. If you're working on a charcoal grill, what I like to do is uh, set it up for indirect grilling. Uh, oh, my God. He's wrong. I'll tell you how to smoke eggs in a minute. You have a pan of ice with a wire rack on it. The hard-boiled eggs get cut in half, and they go over this pan of ice. And then you put wood chips on the coals. You close the lid. You're looking at about 15 to 20 minutes of smoking. Huh. until you see a patina of bronze smoke on the eggs. Now, why the pan of ice? Well, if you cook hard-boiled eggs at a high temperature, they become kind of leathery on the outside, and believe me, I've had a lot of eggs that have done that. Uh -huh. But if you keep the cooking environment cool, it's almost like a cold smoke. You're in business. And by the way, who's your listener that asked It was that? David. David. So David, you're going to take those uh, smoked, hard-cooked eggs, you're going to take the yolks out, puree them with sriracha and mustard and mayonnaise, put them back in the shells, and make the most insane deviled eggs you could ever imagine. That sounds amazing. Are you hungry yet? I'm totally going to do that. Me too. Okay. Here's how to really make smoked hard-boiled eggs. What you want to do is get yourself a smoker or a barrel grill with an offset firebox. You are going to take the eggs, remove the shell from said eggs, place on said smoker. Then, in the firebox, you are going to add no more, no more than four coals of charcoal. Uh, I use Kingsford. They burn the most evenly. So four Kingsford charcoal briquettes, okay? Then you're going to add some wood chips over that once they have burned down a bit. This process will take approximately 30 minutes. Oh, and by the way, don't actually add the eggs. Once you get the wood chips, then add the eggs. Close everything up and keep your eye on the temperature because you do not want this motherfucker getting above 90. Because if it does get above 90, then yes, you will have a leathery style skin. Now, at some point, you do kind of want to move the eggs around so they don't get the grill marks and blah, blah, blah. But that's how you fucking smoke eggs. It's the exact same process as how you smoke cheese. And I guarantee you, this jackass doesn't know how to do that. And yeah, because I have, I do have a, a charcoal grill, yeah. and I tried smoking in it. Yeah. And I didn't do well. Uh, maintaining that heat at low temperature, I found... In, in, in like a Weber or a, in, a, in, a, in a, no, you need an offset firebox. If you want to grill in the barrel grill, that's fine. Use lump charcoal, I beseech you. But no, you need an offset firebox. That's how you do it. Okay, Mrs. Winebox. Um, very challenging in a, in a you kettle You want to know grill. the secret to that? I do. Super easy secret. So you light your uh, grill with um, a chimney starter, right? Yeah. Okay. Use only half as much yeah. coals. Yeah. I think I Ooh. Next time I get my hands in some venison, I'm going to try that. Yeah. These pe he doesn't even know what cold smoking is, which is exactly the, 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 the thing I laid out earlier with the goddamn eggs. 
It's called cold smoking. It's how you smoke cheese and other things. I think I saw that even in here yeah. on one of the directions, I, and I yeah. wondered if I had used too much. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard just with the vents if you use a full chimney to get it down that way. Yeah, it, it was about 300. We, we did ribs and wasn't good. What yeah. kind of ribs? So baby they decks? Were, they were um, or spares. Spares would be too hot, but baby they decks? They were the pork ribs, right? Well, the big ones. Yeah, but spares. Oh, the big ones. See, so yeah, that's your problem. Oh, okay. Because that has to be lower for the big ones. Yeah. yeah. It see, it's, it's funny. It's, um, you start talking about this stuff. Yeah, the problem is, is um, that should have been an offset firebox. The reason is, is unless you and your husband lived alone and we're just going to split half a rack between you, there's not enough space on that fucking grill. But no, it should have been lower. I, I will agree with him there. Um, stuff and it's you know it's it gets involved it's and complicated. Yeah. It's, it's not as easy as is it is it is throwing stuff on a grate and letting right. it rip. You throwing know? a burger and then dumping the garbage plate on top of it, right? <laughs> Yeah. And what's the sauce you put there. on it? What's the uh, sauce? Well, yeah, it's a meat sauce. I meat think sauce. I told you about you this You did sauce. tell me about meat sauce. Yeah, it's like a sauce. I keep looking around the set here, seeing where my little carry-up thing is. I but, know. Uh, Sorry. That's okay. I, uh, yeah. It, it was, it sure was between a garbage, garbage plate and dinosaur. Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. I think you're going somewhere even better than that. Good. Well, but I, no, I, dinosaur is so great. Equally as good. I always like to have experience. I've eaten a dinosaur many times. Good stuff. Very good. Okay. By the way, John, if you're out there. Nice to be here. Uh, okay, all about the. Okay, I think. Uh, do you have grilling sauces for veggies? Yeah, sure. You can. But. All right. Now, you told me a good way in our conversation. Now, so grilling. Now, are we talking about grilling sauces? Are we talking about marinades? The sauces, let's say. Okay. So, what we're going to do? Uh, one of my favorites is just uh, uh, melt butter and stir soy sauce and sesame seeds into it, and scallions, mm. and both brush that on, and then afterwards, uh, and you sort of fry the sesame seeds and scallions in the butter first, then add the soy sauce. Baste with that, and then you pour it over your grilled vegetables. Insane. Sounds great. So you just added a bunch of salt. Well, okay, to be fair, salt and fat. The other two ingredients are meaningless. Insane. Sounds great. Yum. So that's one. Okay. I think you told me one while we were on the phone okay. that I, I really want to try. Let's do it. Is just to brush them with sesame oil, I believe. And that's and right. salt and pepper. Ses yeah, that's great for grilled asparagus rafts. You know, you pin the asparagus together like this and then grill the rafts like that. That's not amazing it's and really so good. easy. Well, see, I mean, that's what Japan does. Japan will take the most amazing asparagus that anyone's ever grown, mm -hmm. grill them over this incredibly high heat uh, grill using a charcoal called bin. Chi, do you think maybe Japan has different tasting asparagus than we do? Chotan. And then three flavorings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, two flavorings, salt and sesame oil. But somehow one plus one plus one equals about 80. And, so, and sometimes those, just those simple preparations are so good. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, your, uh, where do you tape your show? Well, there's ah, a good question, Joe Okay, Kaiser. so every year we do it in a different place. Uh, this past, the current season now, which you're airing, Project Smoke 3, yeah. which you're airing now, okay. was taped in Solvang, California. It's about 40 minutes north of uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Sideways, this is Sideways, that wine movie. Yeah. It's fabulous. Pinot Noir. That's, Pinot exa Noir. that's exactly <laughs> where we were. In fact, in the 13th episode, we go to one of the restaurants that is uh, featured in that. Mm. But stunning location. Uh, more than 100 uh, horses uh, that we would pass every day to the set and back. In fact, in, uh, I think you'll see in the, uh, in the opening shot, I actually ride a horse to the set one day. Nice. Yeah, it was just spectacularly beautiful. It was also, and this you won't see unless you watch the outtakes at the end, century historic cold for that region. So While I, you were grilling. Yeah, so I you know, sort of dressed in a shirt like you'd be for summer grilling. If you saw the crew, 
parkas, fur caps, scarves, down, oh, mittens. No. I mean, it was so cold, it was ridiculous. Cold but beautiful. But the show must go on. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? Show winter grilling. It's not that hard. I do it all the fucking time. My grills don't turn up because it's fucking winter. And I live in Minnesota, motherfucker. Gotta do what you gotta do. How do you pick those places? So, um, you know, we love, I love working in California. And we picked this one because of its, the beauty of the backdrop. It was close to Santa Barbara Bay. Uh, we used a lot of local foods. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our local fisherwoman who brought a sea urchin. Mm -hmm. We made up a recipe on the spot, did it live on the show. It was called mm -hmm. uh, Egg on Eggs. And we cut open the sea urchins, cracked uh, uh, hen eggs in, and then we, uh, we direct grilled the sea urchin with the egg in it. And the wow. egg sort of cooked with the sea urchin. It had to have been so rich and briny. It was astonishing. It was astonishing. Oh, it sounds it. Yeah. Sounds great. Again, you're making me hungry. Or I'm making you hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one, one or the other. Yeah. Um, let's see. Which, uh, Matt uh, wants to know, which area of the country has surprisingly great bar a, a, a surprisingly great barbecue scene? Uh, so you mean aside from Brooklyn, New York? Well, you yeah. can count Brooklyn, New York. No, no, no. And I say that a little tongue-in-cheek because, <laughs> yeah. you know, Brooklyn, probably next to uh, the Hill Country in Texas, has the uh, highest concentration of great barbecue. Yeah. I did not know that. Terrific barbecue. Um, really? Brooklyn? <sighs> Whatever. Fine. Fuck it. I don't care. Other regions in the United States that surprise uh, the Pacific Northwest has some terrific, interesting grilling. You know, what's happened is it used to be, you know, when I wrote my first book on regional American barbecue, uh, BBQ USA, um, barbecue really was truly regional and you only found great pulled pork in the Carolinas and you only found great brisket. And now it's sort of become ecumenical. And uh, you find really, you know, world-class brisket. And well, yeah, because the invention of the Internet. They've taught me. I've learned at the foot of masters. I learned at the feet of giants. And now I'm ready to kick their ass. In Portland, Oregon, you, f you, you can find it in um, uh, outside of Orlando. I mm -hmm. mean, so it's, you know, we, we, we live in the golden age of barbecue. And Hammerhead 547, I have seen minus 40 with a minus 21 chill and grilled in that shit. Well, the whole barbecue competition scene has yeah. to have fed into that. I mean, Absolutely. that's I mean, that's from one end of the country to the other. Competition you know. scene, uh, uh, barbecuing and grilling television, mm -hmm. I think is out the lot. That's true. Yeah, uh, sorry. Cookbooks. I mean, it's um, it really is a goal. He didn't help. He didn't fucking help one goddamn bit. As much as I hate the little ginger fucker, Bobby Flay helped that more than him. Old age for live fire cooking. And here you are. And here I am. Like the expert. Well, thank you. <laughs> Actually, here I am because my trip up here, there was, I was, I, I always, you know, whenever I travel, I always try and have a plan B, plan C. Mm -hmm. And there was no plan B. Uh, all the flights to Rochester, to Syracuse, uh, were all um, uh, oversold. So I'm looking yeah. at it. You know, everyone wants to come here, Stephen. I know. It's, it's For the <laughs> barbecue festival. Tomorrow, <laughs> open to the public at 1 p.m. Yeah, at coming for your event at Field? Frontier Field. At what? Frontier. At Frontier Field. At Frontier yeah. Field. It's all because of you. All right. Um, it's a fundraiser <laughs> for this public television station. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Okay. Uh, marinade. Okay. J.H. Bay, you might have to jump in, but marinator sauce. Uh, what about seafood? I think... Mm. I think maybe she's asking about marinator sauce for seafood. Well, one important principle uh, in barbecuing and grilling, and I talk about it a lot in uh, <laughs> barbecue sauces rather than marinades, yes, of is the do. notion of layering flavors. Okay, mm -hmm. so you might start with a rub, yeah. and then while whatever it is. You do not rub seafood. It's too delicate. I mean, maybe if you're doing the whole fucking fish 
and you're rubbing the scale side. As your cooking is cooking, you might apply a glaze or a mop mm -hmm. sauce or a butter or baste. And then after it comes off the grill, you might serve it with a barbecue sauce or a salsa or a relish or a chutney. So think about layering flavor. Um, with fish, I, uh, it, it's funny, in my mind, everything I say, I can think of the counterexample uh, of. So I was about to say I try and keep it pretty simple to let the flavor of the fish, you know, really shine through. But I don't always do that. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes in Southeast Asia, um, they tend to do the most extravagant spicing on fish. In the West, we tend to keep things pretty simple. The reason they do the spicing on fish is the fish are fairly cheap, oily type fish, like sardines, for example. I know they're not sardines, but I'm using that as an example. If you're talking about salmon, all you would have had to tell the young lady is place a griddle on your grill. Little butter. Put the salmon skin side down. Little little lemon pepper. Little lemon fucking pepper. Little fucking salt. Cook that cocksucker fucking 95% on the skin. Flip it over. Finish it. Done. Now you could have done a few things more extravagantly, of course, but... Jesus Christ! Uh, uh, the re oh my God! Cool. I'm looking at the the questions. Yes, of course. Uh, let's see. And I'm watching all those little likes and bubbles going across your I screen. Know. That's so I, cool, folks. I, I, I haven't been able to watch those, yeah. but um, okay. Oh, this is a really good one. Um, okay, I have a boss. My boss makes beer can chicken all the time. Same. And I, I, when I was look at researching today, yeah. I noticed that you actually have a gadget for that. So I do. We, we gotta, we gotta look into that. Um, anyway, he is, I, we were asked, what are the best beers for beer can chicken? Um, so that brings, this brings us to the paradox of beer can chicken, okay. which is that generally, um, the better the beer, the less likely it is to come in a can. The only exception I can think of to that is Guinness. And or Tennessee. Okay, or is that a local beer? Yes. Uh, that's horseshit. And uh, what's your definition of a good beer? Because by my standpoint, Guinness is horseshit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, cream ale. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I would like to be able to say that the flavor of the beer deeply infuses into the meat. Mm -hmm. And after you've had quite a few beers, you can actually believe that, but you really don't get much <laughs> transfer of flavor. So you can, you can kind of uh, go budget. Yeah, with, you can go budget. Beer. No, that's, 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 okay, maybe he made the point to be completely fair. But no, it's just having some moisture in the goddamn chicken. Now, I don't do my chicken that way. I do it with butter and lemons. With and onions. onions. It's, it's uh, not real save tea. the budget beer for your beer can chicken and the good stuff to drink with it. I think that's great advice, great advice, great advice. Oh, yeah, well, sorry. Uh, this uh, little old piece of trailer park trash, even though I own my own house, but whatever. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll keep drinking Coors Light, you fucking New England fucker. By the way, you know, if you don't drink uh, alcohol, you can do beer can chicken on soda, you can do it on iced tea, you can do it on hmm. cranberry juice. I mean... But why would you want to? No, I'm nah, I'm because totally you do that kidding. and then you make a cranberry barbecue sauce to yeah. go with it. And, you know, I love a theme. Yeah, got it. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Familiar with woods like, okay, this person, Karen, is familiar with woods like hickory, apple, and more strongly mesquite to add flavor. Yes. Are there other unusual smoking items worldwide used to infuse flavor? I am so, what's, what's her name again? Karen. 
Karen Dial Miller. Karen Dial Miller, I am so glad you asked that question because there absolutely are. We're, we're going to leave the realm of wood because they're, you know, in uh, <laughs> Project Smoke, my book, I probably talk about 30 different woods for smoking used around. But let's go beyond wood. Actually, yeah. Now I almost just want to sacrifice a chicken to find out what it would be like to have a fucking Coke can chicken. So, one really cool dish that is done in Canada is you're grilling a steak. The last 30 seconds, you grab a branch of spruce live, still mm. evergreen. You mm -hmm. slap it on your grill grate. You throw the steak on top of it. The high heat of the grill uh, burns the spruce needles, releasing spruce sap yeah. that flavors, spruce smoke that flavors the beef. It's incredible. Mm. Uh, on the west coast of France, on the Ile de Ré, which is a, a little island, sort of the Martha's Vineyard of France, only it has a causeway to get there. Um, they'll, take a, they'll take a skillet that has holes in it, like for chestnut roasting. They'll fill that skillet uh, with dry pine needles and then place mussels on top. Put that over fire. So the pine needles catch fire and they open and cook, cook and open the mussels in a blast of pine smoke. Mm. Totally amazing. Sounds great. Close. Except that wouldn't smoke meat with anything nearing pine. Pine is very sooty. Pine becomes very bitter. Closer to home, you can toss rosemary branches on your fire. Uh, there's a restaurant in Belgium that actually tosses olive pits. They bring truckloads of olive pits from Spain up to Belgium so that they can grill over olive pits. You might pits. as well use them up, right? I you mean, there must bet. be a whole lot of them somewhere. You bet, yeah. It makes total All sense. All those companies that make the little green olives yeah, yeah, with the yeah. little pimentos in them, they had to get those pits out somehow, Yeah, you right? got to do something with them. Cool. <coughs> okay, well, you know what? I think it's time for you and I both to... Eat. Uh, man, I, that, <laughs> I, I am really happy. I love talking about this stuff. I do it all night, but it has been a while since my last meal. So. Yeah. All right. Well, that's where we're going to leave the two pompous New England fucking liberal douchebag jackasses. And this will probably be my last stream because I'm going to go out in my backyard and make a real fucking meal using real grill skills. So. Once again, Steve Reichland, and once again to the person that, why, why do my patrons love to torture me? Why? But once again, Steve Reichland, fuck you. You don't know a fucking thing about what you're talking about. How in the holy high goddamn hell you got to be a grilling icon is beyond fucking me. Seriously. There had to be a fuck-up somewhere. Maybe this is this universe's fuck-up. 